Jane, thank you so much for joining me on the Teachers Podcast today. Yeah, excited, really excited. Are you sure you're excited? Well, you know, a bit <laughs> nervous. You told me not to swear because yes. you're a clean podcast. So I am going to deliver my squeakiest clean <laughs> updates for you. Don't and you I worry. Am, I am so intrigued to see if this actually works out so thank you we'll give it our best shot yeah we will um so we're obviously at reading rocks north um both being invited here by heather and um, so thank you so much for giving up your time because i know that you've been doing a keynote and you're doing workshops and things so the first thing i always ask all guests to do is give me a backstory of how they kind of got into teaching how they maybe got out of teaching or where they are now so yeah. Do you want to just tell me everything? I will. I'll tell you the whole Kit Kat caboodle. I don't know actually know where to start other than uh, I was dragged up in Birmingham and my mum was a teacher mm -hmm. and I was a latch door kid and I was given a key from a very young age and you let yourself in and you made yourself toast and marmite. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, you I, like marmite. Oh. Uh, so on the love marmite side. <laughs> and essentially, um, teachings in my life. Teachers yeah. in my life because my mum's a teacher, my auntie was a teacher, my grand aunt was a teacher and there was a lot of teacher chat in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you'd, you'd help your mum out, you'd, you'd help with books and marking, oh, your dad's probably illegal, probably highly illegal, but I'd help her. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, you, you grow up with knowing about schools yeah. and when you're sick and you, and you want to wag it and be on the sofa at home and, and watch, you know daytime TV, you couldn't do that. Sometimes you'd be dragged into school mm. um, and, you know, glues, glue pens and print stick stuff in books and so help you, out. So you didn't, you didn't go to your own school, but you went to your mum's school? Yeah. And so I became like Mrs Gibb, the teaching assistant for the day, and you got dragged to school. But you love it and you begin to see a window to what teaching's about. And then, then you hit puberty. And then you go, I'm going to do all I can not to be like my mother. <laughs> oh, and I did everything not to be a teacher. Yeah. Oh, my God, I chose A-levels that wouldn't get you into teaching. And then I joined a retail management scheme. And there were 10 of us chosen for House of Fraser. And you were hot housed to be uh, the new business brains of marketing and retail. And... Uh, I won an award because I was just brilliant at selling towels in a department store. <laughs> <laughs> and what I don't know about towels isn't worth knowing. And uh, yeah, and I was retail to my bones and customer service and I was never going to be a teacher. And then they blobbed me into the teacher training department of House of Fraser. Teacher training department in House of Fraser? Not teacher training, wrong words. The training department. The training department. Oh, you see, I can't you stop see? saying teacher. You're just, you're just a teacher. <laughs> I'm just a teacher. No, they and and then I was in the training department, and then I was in charge. Listen, I was 19, and I was in charge of training uh, all the um, Christmas newbies coming into House of Fraser, yeah. and I had to train them on tills. And I was suddenly like this, really only 19, but had to train them on how to uh, use tills, um, you, you know, work good customer service. And then that was it. I, I just knew, just knew deep in my bones that I wanted to be a teacher. How have I just started? How long have I got? Half keep hour. Going, keep, keep going. going. I tell brilliant. you what. And then um, <laughs> I applied uh, at Numa Teacher Training College. Now, you either know this place or you don't. It is in the edit, live edit. An end of Bartley Green that isn't very, let's, an area of socioeconomic deprivation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is barren. There is a reservoir and there's just this Catholic teacher training college. Mm -hmm. And I'm very lapsed in my Catholicism, but I had just <laughs> enough to get me there. And uh, I trained and uh, I got up the duff. Oh. oh, I was at a Catholic teacher, unmarried and pregnant. And uh, what year was this? This is in my second year. And 
and there was a scheme called the Fallen Angel Society, which meant if you were a fallen angel girl who was had sex without marriage and was down on their luck, you could go and plead for money. And I, I did need a bit of extra money at that time. And uh, I got some funding from the Fallen Angels, a, a Catholic-funded society for women who were just, you know, thrown to the wayside under the wing of Catholicism. It's the way you're telling it. <laughs> <laughs> but that bit of money, and do you know what? I'm going to say this, and I might sound arrogant, but blow it. I got a first-class honours degree. Well done. And it was the grit of... I've got to, I've got to make this work for me. Yeah. And um, and then I got a job in Birmingham. And um, thirty four kids I had, and um, and, and one of the girls I taught was in a wheelchair. And then I met probably somebody who I fell in love with very quickly. And I'm going to change her name to protect her because I haven't asked permission to use her name. I met my very own teaching assistant called Mrs Gibb. And we just rocked the world for those kids. She taught me so much. I learned so much from her. And loved teaching to my very bones. And then applied for a job. I'm talking about tons of money now in education, not a promise of money. I'm, I'm, I didn't know I taught in a tons of money era. Mm. I, only looking back now, this was an era where all kids had a glue stick. Yeah. Every term they had a glue stick. And now I see glue sticks with numbers on because we've got to count them back in. Yeah. I didn't teach in that era. There was so much money. Half of this money was in schools. Half of this money was at local education authority level mm -hmm. and they created lots of jobs. And these jobs were to support Ofsted and I went for one of these jobs. And I honestly didn't think I'd get it. And I got it. And I genuinely was shocked and I took the job and by then I had loads of kids and we, we, we lived in Birmingham and I had to go home and announce that we needed to relocate because this mm. job was in Northampton. And um, I worked for the local authority. And um, when I got the job, Leslie, I won't tell you her full name, she was the head of service. She looked at me and she went, I'm taking a punt on you. I'm taking a punt on you, don't disappoint me. And she, you know, and um, and then they, I became one of the um, national literacy strategy trainers around the country. And I don't care what anybody says about the strategy. The clock is live edit rubbish. I get it. Traffic lighting, all of that rubbish. But it was a structure that we had never had before in teaching. I'm not talking about content heavy national curriculum. I'm talking about real research led, evidence based discussion about actually what's going to prop us up when we're stressed. Yeah. And I was one of those frontline leaders of that. And you try and come to me and tell me there's a better document than grammar for writing, there isn't. And I, what I don't know about what's been written about education through a history of time, I'm making my business to know. Mm. I'll read everything. I'll read everyone's books. I am research informed, but I'm not stupid. You'll catch me live in a classroom saying, that's what the research says. Shall we live it? Shall we feel it? Shall we breathe it, kids? What do you think of this, Joshua? And then you'll look over at him writing. I, I just want to say now something that we've got really wrong in education about writing. And it's... It's actually about kids' imaginations. Kids' imaginations are really quite disappointing um, because they are drenched in Fortnite and they have got guns in them and axes and lots of blood and guts. Yeah. And, and we get, and because they're a bit disappointing, we don't nurture them and, and, and help them flourish. We've got to start with the blood, guts and gore. We've got to start with Fortnite. We've got to start with their rubbish ideas. But we've got to help them find, start with what they care about and then take them to new places. And I'll never forget this lad I taught. I looked over his shoulder and we were working with the gorgeous book um, Red Tree by Sean Tan. 
you know when the girl you'll either know this book or you don't and she stands in a field and she's talking and out of the megaphone nobody is hearing her voice out of her megaphone is this disjointed tumbling of letters and um this lad was writing a sentence to go with this picture and he wrote this her dry violin voice and if an adult was writing that they they would talk about this musical instrument but you know what they would write her broken violin voice but i just noticed in that moment he has car crashed that adjective in their dry that's not what we expect you know in the hands of a teacher who doesn't understand children's imaginations they'd go and go oh have a, don't you think it'd be better if it said broken violin no we gotta just live that kids ideas are more remarkable than adults and we've got to notice when they're breaking into those risk-taking word choices mm. that's where the magic happens what was the question <laughs> I like this. Yeah. I like this. You know what? You're still on your back story. I could just. Oh, man. I said Where before we, we did this that, you know, I'm not even going to. Do you want to hear to... that I slept my way to the top? Is that what you want to <laughs> hear from me? Because it's <laughs> not true. So you were telling me that yeah. you went into. Um, you were a consultant, basically. Yes. And then you tell me about the National Literacy Strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then. And then. I got to a point where the DfE was sending me folders mm -hmm. saying this is the script. I don't want a script. Mm. I appreciate structures and systems that can prop us up, but people don't need scripts. Mm. We've got a lot to say. We're on the front line. We don't need scripts. And then I slowly became... It's the trust thing, isn't it? It's and disenfranchised with the system. Then, like, actually, this has gone too far. You kind of feel a, like a mouthpiece for the government. You just think this is good that we have structures, but people don't have to be told what to say. Mm. Don't don't you trust? Don't you trust that we can talk about phonics or grammar or reading? Don't we? Could, thank you for the principles, but you don't have to give us a script. And we were getting hefty scripts from the DfE: three hundred sixty-nine pages, page sixty-nine say this and, and and i got to a point where i go i don't i don't want to just be a mouthpiece for the script mm. and then i went freelance in an era when there was tons of money when people were saying you can be in this job forever jane and i was like no no i'm breaking out i'm breaking out and then at the point i was breaking out then it all changed mm. it all changed and kind of money was stopping and, it, and then people go, don't you want to change your mind? Just come back to the local authority. Just go, just go back and go, and, you know, go and go and be ahead. Come back, come back. You know, and, and, and at that time, um, you know, as part of the local authority, I had I had funded Ofsted training as well. You know, I was in a good place where I could have gone and ran a school or, or, or stayed in the local authority for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I knew I had things to say. And I didn't want to be told what to say. And that was really important to me. And I pride myself on, um, on being truthful and real and honest. And I will tell it straight and I mean it. And those, those are the principles I stick by. And I do get emails from people to tell me to tone it down a bit. Really? And I frame them. They are my favourite emails. <laughs> Do you know what? The more the more fans you have, then the more haters you have. Um, exactly, and got it's to good embrace to appreciate it. them all. Yeah, you've got to, you've got to have haters. Yeah. I've got a lot of fan girls, but you've got to have haters and all. So it's really important. It, it's good to rattle at people's thinking, and when you do that, it can be a bit uncomfortable. Yeah, of course. But do you know what? You wouldn't be so inspirational if you didn't do that. Oh, um, and I'm sat you. here now, and I'm like glued on it every word you know the way that you're telling it you're so inspirational thank oh, you oh thank, thank you, you. I, I just come round to these things so i can get compliments but it's adorable <laughs> <laughs> join the fangirl queue cu love join it oh thank you i'll get to you I eventually will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> clean podcast by the way um so you mentioned you mentioned getting off the training yes um you know how did you just tell me about yeah, it? yeah john burnham 
was my mentor. And um, what they do is they, uh, when they train you up, um, they basically say, uh, you get debriefed. Um, and I got debriefed by John to say, like, this is going to be, this is a, this is going to be a good school, Jane. You're here to be trained. Just sort of almost like toe the party line. What? Hang on. Yeah. So, so you arrive at a school, school and they tell you what the school's going to be. Well, it was in in the old days. Yeah, a lot of data. That was how it was rolling. Like data led you there, and essentially it was like we feel it's that sort of line of inquiry. We feel this is a good school. We are going to. This is old style. Try and obviously. make sure well, it is one. Not. Not that, no, that's not that's not quite correct. We feel this is a good school. We're going to go on a line of inquiry to prove or disprove it. Right. Okay. So that was your kind of debrief. The data we've been given, da, 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 we're going to go and prove it or disprove it. And I said to John, you know, on, on paper alone, what, what do you feel? And he said, I feel like well, this could be a good school. And, and we got there. And um, I just, at every moment in teaching and learning exchanges, just felt it wasn't a school. And um, that weight of responsibility when you have to tell a school they're in special measures, that's, that's tough stuff. Mm. That is re that's hard stuff. Um, but you don't ever come to a decision easily. Mm. Um, and I am so grateful for that Ofsted training. It's a long time ago now, but that has really informed um, I think two sides to my thinking, yeah. which I truly understand this sort of how we judge as a school um, in terms of the standards agenda mm -hmm. and that how that is constantly evolving. And I also recognise the minute Ofsted say uh, we care about knowledge rich curriculums, that's a tidal wave. That's that, that one small comment. That is the tsunami, the impact. And this is what Ofsted have got to start realising the smallest of uh, the things that seem really, you know, not that important or just kind of a passing comment. Yeah. The impact. I, I know a lot of teachers who lost their summer holidays building knowledge organisers, yeah. sharing knowledge organisers, because these things have such a huge impact. Of course. Enormous. A tsunami of impact back in school. And in some ways it's a flippant comment. It's a flippant comment. It's a flippant comment, but it's it's people want to do right. People want to do well. And teachers are good guys. Yeah. We are morally good guys. So we want to do, we, hey, we're not doing things for Ofsted. We're doing things for children, of course. But all of the, everything we have to take on, it's a lot of interfacing between national curriculum, research, Ofsted messages. There's so much, so much to... Um, consider and, and that's the tough, toughest thing about teaching and of course the job list never ends yeah. it never ends no. so actually you have to be the, the master of your own job list you have to walk away from your job list because it will never end and that's such a tricky thing I think for so many teachers and I think sometimes the only way to walk away from the job list is to walk away from the job do you know what? That's sad. I see some it of the. Is sad. I, I, I've got genuinely in my, genuinely, clothes now. But for the last three years, uh, the woman who used to measure my bust in Marks and Spencers was an ex-teacher. Yeah. Who walked away. Mm. And uh, we we joke we joke about it. I go there every four months in the hope that my bust might be bigger. <laughs> but I'm always still a 32. B. I'm an A really, but you know what I mean. I'll just add a cup on. It's depressing. So if, if, if you're listening, then maybe you should check out. <laughs> 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 but we used to laugh. I say it's the same thing, really. It's all about the numbers. It's all about data, really, love. <laughs> about the numbers. I say, can we lie about these numbers? <laughs> oh, God. Love her. Oh, Do you know what? And I tell that story because she was a good teacher. Mm. She worked rubbish she walked away interestingly she she worked in a small rural village school do you know sometimes small schools feel like a an easier option but everything's compounded and magnified yeah. and then you're trying to do four jobs yeah <sighs> that's like mind-blowing brain explodes stuff tough yeah. tough yeah really tough thank you um 
So, <laughs> thank you. Can we move on from the bust? Yes, thank you. I'm just thinking, how do I move into the next question now? Just do it. Do it. So, we'll slick a link in after. <laughs> this will all be live, you know. <laughs> <laughs> when, it's, it's humorous as well. Um, so, when we were uh, talking before, so we had yeah. a quick, quick chat in the um, auditorium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you were saying, you know, you you take the research from the top. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, you work with that. Yeah. So what research do you actually look at? The truth is I go straight to the Education Endowment Foundation because they've done the hard work for us. Mm -hmm. They have filtered all the... Because you can, you can be information overload on Google. Yeah. You know, that is like, whoa, you know, I've got so much information, but I'm just kind of don't know where to start i go straight to the education endowment foundation because they have filtered it for me and tell me you know this is a longitudinal study this is worth it this has this amount of impact so when somebody says it has a very extent i'm interested in the very extensive mm. so when the education endowment foundation say to us there is very extensive research that this will have such good impact in the front line, let's say for reading, reading mm -hmm. alone at key stage two, the evidence says if you can model a strategy in action for reading, all right, well, thank you, Education Endowment Foundation. What does that mean? Yes. So I live that, I bring modeling a strategy in action. Okay, how do you model a reading strategy in action? It is more than just reading aloud. Mm. The heart of the matter with reading the heart of the matter is to read for meaning. Mm. There is nothing else that needs to be done. Once you're, once you're over the decoding hurdle, the whole point of reading is to read for meaning. And um, within that, how, how do we show children how to read for meaning? We have to show them our reading brain. We mm. can't show them. So we have to start articulating the invisible and make it visible. So from the education endowment research, for me, one of the most important things that we've got to do is we've got to show kids how to, we've got to be demonstration readers. So when I read, I then go, I'm going to stop on this sentence. Nurse Betty, who smelt nice and had candy floss hair, scooped Sophie back into bed and slowly tucked her in. That for me is then I show kids, look, this sentence, look, this is my reading brain. I'm going to show you how I'm ringing out meaning. Nurse Betty, this sentence is about Nurse Betty. She smells nice. Question, is she nice? Well, we read the twits last week. Mr Twit didn't smell nice. He wasn't nice. Is there always a correlation? I don't know, but she smells nice. She had candy floss hair. I can visualise that. She's got a candy floss on her head. You know, mm. it's, it's a big beehive, it's pink. I think the author has used candy floss because they're trying to say Nurse Betty is sweet. Mm. And then we scooped her back in. Scooped is making me think of ice cream. You know, they're stretching that sweet bit of imagery, you know, and slowly tucked her in. You can't wander around my ward, firm but fair, sweet and nice, but do as you're told. I, I got We've got to show kids yeah. how we're reading for meaning. Yeah. We don't do that. Did you think of that sentence just off the top of your head? No, I wrote that sentence in my own book. I I, I've, got, I've written a couple of picture books. That is amazing. I was like, wow, she's got so much from that. Did you know it? I wrote it myself. It's in my, it's in my picture book called The Last Straw. Sophie's in hospital and Nurse Betty is based. I'll tell you who she's based on. Are oh, you being served? Mrs Slocum. Oh, That's yes. That's Nurse Betty, Mrs Slocum. Do you find then, um, so obviously I'm going to jump ahead now, so you've obviously written a picture book. I've written three picture books. Three picture books. So mm. do you find it so much easier to teach from those because you've been able to put all the content in that you want to get out? No, no, it's the truth. Because when I read them, I'm disappointed in myself. I literally kick myself. <laughs> why, they, why did you use that word, but you is idiot? That, but no, is that because, yeah, you know, no, that's you as a person? No, I use... I use all the short animation films that have won Oscars. Mm -hmm. Dear Basketball, you know, about Kobe Bryant, who is a lovely little non-fiction film. You know, I use the classic, The Piano. Mm -hmm. I use Ross Montgomery and David Litchfield 
books bearing the piano. I use I use the best picture books. I, I go to the Carnegie Prize winners. Yeah, I love books. I can tell. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to I've stopped myself saying something really rude. I'll tell you that after. Okay, all oh, good. <laughs> I'm sorry that you won't be able to hear it on the podcast. <laughs> So, um, I feel like I could just listen to you all day. Um, good, good. So, Let's do a day podcast. Yeah, Let's I mean, do you don't it. mind listening to this for weeks in the car, do you? <laughs> <laughs> We're just looking at Z right now, who's going to edit oh. <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> um, so, one of the things that I always ask um, yeah. when people come on the podcast is that um, you know you could give ideas that teachers can use in the lesson that aren't going to take a lot of time, yeah. they're not going to take a lot of money, but yeah. something really valuable. Now, yeah. I know you you uh, talk a lot about reading, yes. um, but writing is something that I haven't had yeah. much of, so yes. can you, can you can. give us some ideas of, of writing that teachers could really go, do you know what, I'm going to try that in my classroom. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've got so much to say about writing, but I am going to try and keep it to three. Number one, one of the things where we go wrong with the teaching of writing is we get a bit obsessed with sequence. Like, you know the story, you can retell the story, what happened first, what happened next, what happened after. And kids feel from us when we teach like that is the sequence is the most important thing. Mm. This is only a subtle shift, but this will improve your writing inordinately. If you get kids to be central character writers. Mm. Worry, take sequence, have less sequence, have less plot points, but actually write truly empathetically in that character's shoes. And what I call impact writing. This has only dawned on me in the last year, and I mean this when I say this is, this is so crucial. And we've known about it actually from research since the 80s, but it's so obvious, we didn't know what to do with it in the classroom. And it's basically this, authors are broadly writing to create positive or negative effects. You know, from a kid's perspective, smiley face stuff or sad face stuff. And once you get kids to understand that, that half of the teaching in this country is rubbish. I don't mean half of us are good and half of them are rubbish. I mean, within your teaching, half of it is rubbish. Because if I ask kids to describe a storm, and I don't tell them if it's a positive or negative storm, half of the words are not right. Mm. Half of it's wasted. I can't tell the kids this is a positive storm. The farmer has been waiting for this storm for weeks. This is the farmer's story. This is his plot, character impact, his story. And so essentially, once we know it's a positive storm, we can get words on the right side of the street. You can get it right quicker. Exactly. Quicker, harder, faster. There's a song in there somewhere. <laughs> I love Daft Punk. I like to put a donk on most things. <laughs> oh. Okay, right. So, um, giving them um, more ideas. I didn't say three, did I? No. Should I say my third one? Because I yeah, said on. like character impact, yeah. positive, negative. Yeah. I've got so much to say. What should I say with my third one? I've made a big, like, always oh, my third one. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I love it. Oh, I'm actually going to say um, kids need to be taught how to graft to sentences. Do you know, we live in an era of language deprivation. We're worrying about words. But do you know what we do wrong as teachers? Sometimes we get so stuck collecting words. Yeah. They don't go anywhere. And what we've got to keep reminding... All over the walls, up the walls. Let me tell you this, quickly up the walls. Favourite school I ever saw. They gave out T-shirts. Right. With sewn on Polly Pockets to the staff, all adults, with washing instructions, right? This is in my new spelling book. That's out now. Oh, there's a bit, see how I slid that in there? A bit of a <laughs> yeah, reference yeah. to my new spelling book. That's coming soon. <laughs> we'll anyway. put that in the show notes. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Let me tell you this. This school, right, they were worrying about words and actually them blending into wallpaper. And um, so all teachers had a sewn on Polly Pocket every day. They wore a new word. I was working with an English subject leader doing some action planning and I'm glad we've looped this back as a little link. The only way I can describe her is bosomly. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, so jealous. So did you go to a ministry? <laughs> How jealous of her. She had thunderous written across her chest. <laughs> That's quite hard to concentrate. But they are living, breathing words. They're not blending into the... That is teachers really caring about words. Mm. They're wearing them. Yeah, kids need to be taught it's about driving words into sentences yeah. because that's where meaning is yielded. Mm. If I said to you, is thin positive or negative? Is it, is it? You don't know. No. You don't Depends know. on the context. Exactly, till it's in a sentence. Roald Dahl, you know, let's put thin in a sentence. George noticed grandma's thin, icy grin. Well, thin in Victoria Beckham's fa fashion show last night was positive. Yeah. Thin here is attached to a grin. No one likes a thin smile. Yeah. So you don't know. It's all right collecting words. But sentences is where it's at. And often a lot of the evil characters are really thin. Yes! So you just don't know, do Yes! You? Careful what you judge of me now. <laughs> you, need <to> be, <laughs> you need to be watching the YouTube. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That yeah. That to make sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're listening, oh, keep thinking. It's, it's yeah, if you're listening, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for those three <laughs> ideas. Not this is going to be the weirdest podcast I've ever done. I know. Oh, I'm, I'm proud no, of that. I'm, I'm proud of weirdness. I love that. I didn't that. say it was bad. Embrace weirdness. The yeah. kooky, the kooky and the weird. There's a, there's a lot of us out there and we've it's taken us a long time to show our weirdness. I, I kind of think, you know, I said to you just before the podcast, like the more the more time goes on and the more I kind of expand into to, to my role at Classroom Secrets, the more eccentric I realise I'm, I'm allowing myself to be. <laughs> good, good. Um, Embrace so it. I, I love it. Care. I think um, it makes you uh, inspirational, but also worth listening to. Oh, thank you. you thank go. you. Um, but also not just for <laughs> I'm going to dig myself out of that hole. Yeah. Anyway, right, tell me about the books. All yeah. the books. Tell okay. me all about them. Um, basically, um, my first book was Right Stuff. And that is everything I care about um, in terms of what I was talking about earlier with the National Literacy Strategy. We do need structures, mm -hmm. but we don't want to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. And in the Right Stuff, you get a structural system that's going to prop you up when the stress is on. Mm -hmm. You know, for many of us in teaching, our marriages are on the rocks. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, some things are going to tip us over the edge. Mm -hmm. But I tell you what, right stuff won't tip you over the edge. It will prop you up because it can be applied to any picture book, any novel, any film. It's a structural view. Oh, I nearly said a weird, I nearly said poo then. <laughs> Starting, not so clean podcast. So essentially, it's a structural <laughs> view and it talks about the teaching of sentences a lot, the cruciality of sentences. Mm -hmm. And it talks about teaching kids uh, structures to help them with the ideas of writing. Mm -hmm. The ideas of writing and that we can have, the senses can give us ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, we could write sound senses, sentences. We could write... Um, um, sight sentences but we can write there's more than just senses we've got feeling sentences action inner thought speech I talk very closely about the nine ideas for writing did you know there are only nine I did not know there are only nine there but only now no, I do there are nine there are no more than nine this is the maths of writing there are nine and when we teach kids like that there are nine five senses feelings action speech and thought that's really powerful kids knowing there are nine yeah. wow great a system yeah but it's not just about the ideas of writing i do truly care about the grammar of writing mm -hmm. and we need to teach that in a systematic way and then we've also got the lovely exciting techniques of writing like simile and onomatopoeia and alliteration 
but I can teach kids that sense of, you want to be a good ideas writer, there are nine ideas. You want to be good at grammar of writing, I'll teach you how to be good at the grammar of writing. I'm going to say this very quickly about the grammar of writing. It's about looking at authors who inspire us and say, look, you want to write a Philip Pullman sentence? It's not about the content. I'm going to show you how to structure a sentence like Philip Pullman. You want to write a Terry Pratchett sentence? Do you know what Terry Pratchett does? I love this. <laughs> Do you know who told me this? A year six girl told me this. Really? I was interviewing her because she was a great depth writer and she just loved reading. I said, who's your favourite author? Terry Pratchett. I said, why do you love him? She goes, miss, because what Terry Pratchett does for grammar. I'm like, shut up, what you want about what he does for grammar? What you want about, love? And she said, miss, you know how an ordinary writer writes this? I said, writes what? Well, puts two adjectives before a noun. I'm like, well, what do you mean? She goes, an ordinary writer would write this. The old tall house stood on a hill. I'm like, yeah, right. I said, so what does Terry Pratchett do? She went, miss, he does this. The house stood on a hill, old, tall. Don't you think that's more atmospheric? I said, I do, Alice. But nobody likes to show off. <laughs> <laughs> but in that great, like, chuck your adjectives at the end of your sentence. And when I talk about... old understanding that. Yeah. And I say that, I say that, look, you want to write a Terry Pratchett sentence, chuck your adjectives at the end. You want to write a Cressida cow, a uh, Cressida, sorry, darling, sorry. Wizard of what, John? Cressida does. She does draw you in, long rambling description, jot you at the end. You want to write one of them? You want to write one of them? I'll teach you how to write a Cressida sentence. Love that. Chuck me a Philip Pullman. Chuck me a Jacqueline Wilson. I'm not scared. And what I love about that is that you, you're linking it so intensely to books in a way that I've never heard anyone talk about before. And you're talking about hooked on books. I'm just looking at your other, yeah, yeah. Your other book now. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, you're not going to find anyone who cares about reading and writing more than me. I make it, not only do I care about it, I live it, I breathe it, I teach it. You know, when teachers say to me, oh, oh, you won't be able to do that with my kids. See it as a challenge. I roll my sleeves up and I'm teaching in that room the following week. And do you know what kids teach you? Kids are the most honest. Yeah. They'll put you straight. They'll put you straight. Something that the Education Endowment Foundation tells you will make a critical difference. Well, it hasn't made a critical difference in this room, Education Endowment Foundation, because it's not just about being research-led. It's about you've got to live it and you've got to say, What's right for these kids in this school? That's, mm. that's, that's what it's about. Yeah. But I also think it's about being able to identify what is going to make a difference yes. as well. You, know, yeah. you need people yeah. like you who, yeah. who understand it on a, on a deeper level and have seen a lot more. And I'll tell you something else. Um, do you know what else it's about? It's about, it's such a shame it's this word. I, have, I don't know if it can be another word. It's about professional love for children. Mm. It's, uh, uh, but love in such a deep way that I am going to, I, not even me. Actually, this is not about me. This is about me empowering teachers to show them a clear pathway to be better reading and writing teachers. Mm. And I truly can help people with that. It's exciting times. Yeah. Twitter is one big fat staff room. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's brilliant. It, it, it's, that's real. That's honest. I love all of that. Mm. I love it when people slide into my DMs. I really <laughs> love that. <laughs> shall, I, shall I DM you later then? Yeah, do it. <laughs> do it. I don't, because I'm going to a rave later. All right. Oh. Well, I, it's all right. You don't have to reply <laughs> till tomorrow. Maybe in the morning when you're a bit hungover. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to ask you some questions. Do it. <laughs> Please don't make me regret them. <laughs> I always ask people these. Um, so, if you could wave a magic wand, how would you solve the life-work balance problem? Okay, how would I solve it? You can't solve it. It's what I said earlier, your list never ends, you can't solve it. But, and really interestingly, 
the TES have asked teachers that. And do you know what teachers say? They want more time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you know what kids say? Do you know what kids want more of? More time. Yeah. Do you know what everyone wants? More, more time. time. Do you know what early years research tells us? That actually kids want us to look into their eyes, not down at them. And that's really important. That, that's really interesting to me because how many kids do we talk as we go down the corridor going, oh, yes, lovely, yes, that's lovely, Aaron, yes, 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 of course, yes, your hamster, oh, dear, what a shame. Anyway, anyway, we'll catch up later, run along, there's a good boy, why do you... Mm. That is me looking like I care about kids. Mm. No. Because actually to get at their eye level and, and actually connect and look at them, and this is an answer even your question, but time is the most precious commodity of all. And I do think in that regard about reading, it's a different mode, isn't it? It's slow. And to be a good reading teacher, it's almost pulling us against everything. Pace, rigour, dynamic, moving. Yeah. To be a good reading teacher, you've got to lie on your back and connect with the earth. We've got to read slowly uh, and we've got to do the page 50. Page 50, you know, if it's a tricky novel, you're not even going to like it till page 50. Mm. That's, a, that's a lot of, that's a lot of, got to, that that's a, a lot of pages. That's a lot of pages you've got to get through before you even, even begin to think, I like this book. Yeah. But on the, on the, uh, basically, I actually think we've got to work on our marriages. We've got to work on our marriages. And um, I suppose, the work-life balance starts there. You, you've got to work on your marriage because if you've got somebody, or relationships, or, or whatever, you, yeah. you've got to work on that because, do you if know, you're prioritizing that. Then you've you got are. to. You've got to. Uh, I'm not going to give details on how to work on your marriages. <laughs> you can make those your details own. before the podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can work that out for yourself, but it's it's really important because. Um, Teachers who are in five years of teaching, mm. they're leaving us. Yeah. You know, and, five and years, they're going, I'm walking away. And all that experience that they've gained in those five yeah. years that you yeah. can't get anywhere else. No, no. And um, so, yeah, I think you should have sex more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said that one. I wanted yeah. you to say that. Yeah, work on your marriages. Love Thank it. You. <laughs> right. So, who was your favourite teacher at school and why? Oh, Mrs McCarthy. Without a shadow of a doubt, year seven, the equivalent, it wasn't, it wasn't, we were never called year seven, mm -hmm. first year, secondary school. And um, she crept up behind me and she had, um, she was probably, she was probably only 50 actually, but she looked 70 and she had a really kind of stiff sort of hairdo and glasses on the end of her nose. And there was just like this, hot breath on my neck of kind of coffee and fags <laughs> and you liked it <laughs> oh man that sort of reassuring sort of breath of experience and she whispered into my ear you are going to be a writer mm. and um that that just stuck with me and she affirmed that it was true yeah I didn't want to be that when I grew up though. No, I didn't want to be a writer. I didn't want to be a teacher. I resisted it against all my bones. And I, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a writer. It, do you do want you, when, when I was a writer, it's just like, oh, it just, just, just felt like that can't be a job. It's too easy. Mm. But I know, do you know what I wanted to be? I wanted to be a West End triple threater. I can tap dance. You didn't know that about me, did you? I didn't, but you know what? I can tap dance. I did think there's definitely some kind, because I did performing arts. It's a showgirl. Yeah. yeah. I tell you what, I can tap dance. I'm good at drama. And then somebody told me, somebody told, well, I, I was part of the chorus mm -hmm. at the Birmingham Hippodrome. Uh, you know, of, of productions like The King and I. We, yeah. we, we were the, the back chorus girls. Yeah. And um, somebody told me when I was part of that chorus, can you just sing 
a little bit quieter. Because <laughs> I wasn't a triple threater. I actually could dance and I could drama, but I couldn't sing. <laughs> so my West End dreams were dashed. Damn it. <laughs> so, but yeah, if given half the chance, some tap shoes. I'd, I'd, yeah, love that. I actually did drama A level. I love drama. I love theatre. I love it. I love going to the theatre. I love taking kids to the theatre. Matilda. Oh, if you've not seen Matilda at the West End, go. Oh, man, it's just stunning. Yeah. There's some great stuff out there. Yeah. What um, are we supposed to be talking about? I don't know. Um, well, Education. You, yes. <laughs> all of it. But it's all right. You're doing great at answering my next question. So thank Do you. It. Um, Do it. So I don't know if I dare ask you this. Do so, it. Where do you think education needs to go in the next 10 years? Where, where do I think it's going to go or where does it need to where go? Where do you think it needs to go? Where would oh. you want it to go? Oh, it needs, actually the truth is, where it needs to go and where it is going, I think are aligning. And where it needs to go is to a real and honest place. Actually, because we're bankrupt mm. and everyone's distracted by Brexit, don't get me started by, about politics, we won't go home, but essentially, because education's not really having a look in, this is also really wonderful, mm. because there's this groundswell movement of people who are driving what matters mm. and what's important, and this groundswell people movement, this is powerful. Mm. And we seem to have this sort of space in education because of lack of time or uh, Brexit is taking it. They're, they're not looking at education. So actually that, that breathing space mm. is good space for us in education. Yeah. And I like that. And I actually am worried if they start looking again very closely at us because when it becomes too much like dictatorship, that's when it's at its worst. But I don't think it'll ever return to that, actually, because the, the power of the people is too strong at the moment. Yeah, it's almost like they need to let things happen and then when they come along to, to write something again, look at actually what is being done. And yes. And maybe write that out. Yes, I agree. I absolutely agree with that. I see some wonderful stuff on the front line where you can actually touch and feel really productive, wonderful things happening in schools. Schools who have got their, um, their mission pitched to guiding principles that aren't so big and vague, like we care about resilience, like, mm, yeah, right, but it's, it's too vague, isn't going to get us anywhere. But when I talk about principles that have more meat on them, and actually a school has talked about what that looks and feels like. These are the schools where it's big enough for you to come in as a member of staff and dance under these principles. Schools that have 90 page policies of kind of micro, mm. uh, a PowerPointed lesson. How these, could you even remember them? The, these, these schools are gonna be the schools that are gonna lose their way, where it's so dictated. People need big structures, big principles to dance under but we've also enacted them on the front line so we know what they look and feel like. These are the schools that will win in the future. Mm, thank you. Not at all. I've got a last question. Do it. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. Who's your inspiration within education? Um, I think Professor Tim Brighouse, who was uh, in Birmingham when I was a teacher in Birmingham, and he, he was able to, in my mind, cut through government message mm -hmm. and government agenda and keep us all rooted in Birmingham on what really mattered. And he taught in an educational sense. I know we know about it in terms of the rainforest, but he talked about in an educational sense, the butterfly effect. All right, yeah. And that has really had an impact on me, how the smallest of things can make the biggest of difference. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk about an outstanding school I went to that was outstanding, really, really outstanding. Not outstanding on paper, like, oh my God, you can feel it. And um, I was about to teach in this school and uh, the door was open and I looked into the classroom and uh, this is Colebrook Dale. I'm going to rep for this school, amazing school uh, in Ironbridge. 
and um, I, I looked into the classroom, I was about to teach in this year five room and there was a girl on the floor uh, in a blank, uh, wrapped up in a blanket and I had said to the teacher about 20 minutes prior, um, is there anything I need to know? And she said no. I was a bit miffed about this actually. There's sort of this ground swell of anger. I was like, surely I need to know about this kid on the floor in a blanket. And uh, I actually hoiked out the teaching assistant. I was in the corridor. And I called her over. I said, can, can you just tell me about, about this girl on the floor? I need to know about I'm about to teach in this room. And she said, oh, um, actually, they're all looking after Sophie. M Mrs. Constant, you don't need to worry about her. We, we, we're, gonna, we're looking after Sophie. And I walked into that class and I was had a rage on. Like, don't tell me then. Like, don't tell me this is not gonna this is not gonna work out, is it, if you don't tell me? Started teaching and I said, Oh Sophie, don't you want to join in? We're here for teaching and learning. Surely you want to join in. And three kids stood up. Almost they weren't holding hands, but they were shoulder to shoulder and they they kind of stood up in front of me and almost like a, like a protected fence around her. And they went, Miss, Sophie's mum and dad are having a divorce and she's not feeling ready for learning today. And we're looking after her till she is ready. And it was in that moment, it was kids who had to remind me how to be a good teacher. I could cry about that because that was me at my worst. That's why you have to keep teaching kids. And we're both having a cry now. Thank you so much. Um, what an amazing story to end the podcast on. Um, <laughs> everything you've talked about will be in the show notes. <laughs> I just feel like this was just, just the perfect ending. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Absolute so much. Absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.